Well, good afternoon. I'm Mike Snelly from the Department of Horticulture, Landscape Architecture at Oklahoma State University. And I'll serve today as a co-moderator for the latest Shackleford, Solomon Shackleford 2022 lecture series. And I wanna make sure I do some acknowledgements before I get into our speaker and, and her topic today. I, of course, would be remiss if I didn't once again acknowledge Linda Shackleford and Charles Shackleford, former co-owners of TLC Oklahoma City. Uh, they ran a successful retail operation that they always enjoy being in the top 100 retailers for the United States for at least, I think they enjoyed that for at least the last 15 years, if not 20 of their career, uh, they again spanned for over 30 years. And Lyndon and Charles have been longtime supporters not only my programs, but everybody else in the department for at least the last 35 years. So even before I came on the scene. So thank you, Charles and Linda, if you're listening or if not, maybe you'll hear my acknowledgement on a later YouTube. I also wanna thank Peter Harwell and Donna Dollins and Craig Woods and others that helped me put this together faithfully each month. Uh, we're going into almost month 18, almost now a year and a half into uh, the Zoom series it has been uh, quite a, a learning curve, but uh, it's been a, a great alternative to real live workshops, which I look forward to getting back into later this year and certainly for 2023. And thank you all that are listening for your loyalty and, and encouragement as we struggle through learning new technology and trying to make uh, lemonade out of this COVID debacle. Uh, I'm excited today though, to talk about uh, an individual that I met in the Pacific Northwest, I don't know, at least 25, maybe 30 years ago. We're excited to have Nancy Butley with us today, who serves as Director of Communications for J. Uh, Frank Schmidt and Company, Wholesale Tree Growers of Boring, Oregon, where she's been talking trees now for over 27 years. And so this is interesting that I learned about Nancy. She was a newspaper reporter before I met her, and then she earned a bachelor's degree in technical journalism and horticulture from Oregon State University. Lifetime honorary member of the American Society of Landscape Architects, Nancy's earned national recognition for her tree advocacy and stewardship, stewardship efforts, including over a decade of service on the board of directors of Friends of Trees. Uh, Nancy, they've had your bio for so, quite some time, so I'm not gonna belabor this because we're running behind at this point. So I just want to uh, welcome you back to Oklahoma State University and the, the floor is yours, Nancy. Thank you so much, right. we're excited. All right, well, I'm happy to be here. Um, virtually in Oklahoma is better than not being in Oklahoma at all. I've been to Tulsa, Oklahoma, and uh, Oklahoma City a couple of times, and uh, Tulsa Botanic Garden, and visited some customers there. And so I really like the state and enjoy, and I'm really happy to be here. Um, I will uh, get started on my talk. And I just wanna say we have a lot of great customers in, um, in Oklahoma and, and we're really thankful that people in um, Oklahoma love our trees and grow a lot of them. And we're happy to contribute to the shade canopy through our partnership with our many great customers in your fine state. So. Um, I'm sure there are a few people out there that I know I haven't seen for a while, and I just want to say I'm happy to be here, and thank you for your welcome, and Mike, thank you for inviting me to speak here in Ray from here from Rainy, Oregon. So um, have we got the screen up and looking up okay? It looks fantastic. Okay, ready to go. Well, welcome to Oregon. Uh, this is where I work, right? My cur you're, yep, there's my cursor right there. That's, I'm right here in the back corner of this building. Um, and this is our headquarters in Boring, and um, we've been here 75 years growing trees. Just a little aerial view for you. This is, uh, of course, Mount Hood on the east, and this is our headquarters. This is, I'm going to talk about our uh, refrigerated cold storage a little bit. This is our shipping warehouse and I live right down a couple miles off to the, the right so I have a really tough commute. I have to look at Mount Hood coming and going every day in my little two mile drive to work so <clears throat> I feel pretty pretty fortunate to 
to be work be able to work here and uh, work and play in this fine state. So greetings from boring Oregon. Uh, we've got some hashtags going shade starts here. Trees are the answer and keep calm and plant trees. Uh, we have been growing trees here for 75 years. That's a collective we. Actually, the Schmidt family started this nursery. Frank Schmidt started this nursery in, in 1946 and grew it from 10 acres to a little over 3,000 now. It, uh, six different farms now that we have all in Oregon. Um, just a little bit about us before we get going. It's a family business. Uh, second generation is just retired and third generation is, is running the show with, with help from uh, the, the second generation, Frank, Jan, and Jean Schmidt Webster. They're all on our board. We've got pretty good, pretty good smooth transition, uh, board of directors and a great group, a uh, great management group and uh, about 350 employees. So it's, it's a big operation and um, we do our best to grow the best trees we can. So about 3000 acres and we grow more than 500 varieties and cultivars of trees. Um, mostly deciduous, few conifers. And uh, we have a dedicated research and development program, which is uh, really makes our company unique. I think that's probably the most unique thing. We do uh, breeding, selection, evaluation of trees. And over the years, about 40 years, that they really actually worked on developing new trees. Uh, over the years, we've introduced about 200, I mean, sorry, 100 new tree introductions and co-introductions. Uh, quite a few of those were developed here through our own breeding and selection efforts, and many other fine trees were brought to us by customers, horticulturists, different people who had an eye for something different and unique, and they would they would bring the trees to us for trial and uh, evaluation and possible co-introduction. So trees are nurtured in our fields um, over a period of like five to seven years, which is a few shots just to give you the flavor of what we do and bare root digging there on the left. And uh, we couldn't do any of it without this really great skilled, dedicated tree team that we have. We have a lot of long-term employees and they're really the best in the business. Um, this scene right here is uh, planting spring spring planting on the left uh, loading a truck with a forklift there the the forklift driver osterberto he's been with us for 39 years i think his wife has been there just a few years less and they're just really critical essential parts of our team so those those uh uh b and b trees are being forklifted into a um into a 53 foot truck in our load, one of our loading dock bays. Uh, the fellow in the middle right is budding trees. Um, he's summer, that's a summertime project. And uh, the scene on the right is our uh, greenhouse, uh, heated greenhouse where we grow out our tissue culture. So after we grow the trees, they're entrusted to our customers without whom we'd be nothing. Um, on the right is uh, trees of Corrales, and those are royal raindrops, crab apples, but the Sandia Mountains and, and uh, um, the river, Rio Grande River uh, in the background. And uh, that's an Illinois nursery up at the top and, and another Illinois nursery on the right. And uh, Loma Vista Nursery just over the border in, in Kansas is the pot and pot operation. So after our, our trees go to our customers and grow on in their fields or their container yards, off they go. And some of them end up in really high profile places. They're planted across the continent. And um, I try to keep track of the kids and uh, see how they're doing sometimes. The, the swamp white oaks are in front of Independence Hall. They started out at our nursery, um, they're grown on by a Pennsylvania nursery. Uh, Halka Nursery, many of you probably heard of that company. They grew the green spire lindens that were propagated at our nursery that, that uh, framed the, 
the National Police Memorial in front of the National Building Museum. And uh, I was being a tourist in Washington, D.C. And, and I saw a tree over me. You know, everybody else is looking in the Capitol, looking at the Capitol, getting on and off the buses. And I'm going, huh, that, that looks like a pretty nice elm. So I went over and sure enough, there was our paint coat on that Valley Forge elm right in front of the Capitol. So uh, I'm, I tend to be a tree tourist when I go traveling. And on the right is uh, University of Chicago Plaza in uh, Chicago. So our trees get around. So how do they get there? Well, it's a long story and many hands, many years, lots of planning, uh, lots of effort. It's really a team effort uh, of propagators, which we fill that function. And then our, our field and container grower customers around the country. And to bring that two inch tree to market, uh, it's been somewhere between, well, it's about 15, 12, 15 years. So we have the trees up to seven years and then our customers will have them for a lot of times that much time to grow the big trees. Um, this um, is our crew in the hoop houses, the poly houses, sticking exclamation plane tree cuttings in, in high heat and into bark and well watered. And um, then planted in the field the next year. There's a sign there that says platinous, platinous exclamation. And then they go on from there. So this uh, timeline, um, this graphic, which was prepared by uh, the graphics are courtesy of Herr Schaut, uh, Landscape Architects in uh, Chicago. They do, drew this wonderful graphic that, um, that uh, shows how we as propagators have the trees for, um, for up to seven years. And then we saw in that first frame, and then another several years uh, where they're growing up to say two inch caliper. And then, then the uh, really large caliper growers will take those trees like up to year 15, 18. So this, pay, this is a page out of our reference guide and it'll also be part of a handout that we pre prepared for you. And so it just shows really nicely graphically shows how we, uh, the timeline that it takes to bring, uh, in this case, a, a pl lemon plane tree, an exclamation plane tree to market um, somewhere between I don't know, 12 to 8, 10, 15 years, depending on how big it's grown. And then not to mention the 50 years that it took to develop that tree through breeding at Mor Morton Arboretum. So shade starts here at our nursery. This is, we call this high forest farm. And uh, this is where we grow seedlings and softwood cuttings and do our tissue culture. Here's an aerial view. Um, those are all poly houses that are stuffed full of uh, softwood cuttings. And like the ladies were sticking the exclamation plane trees. And uh, it's just a si continuing cycle. And then the, on the high left is the, um, our heated greenhouse where we grow the tissue culture. And then of course the fields where we either sow seed, uh, lots of acorns go out every year, either sow seed or transplant trees out the cuttings. They'll be transplanted into a bed and grown for another year, sometimes two. So this is the kind of a graphic of the production steps. Um, it's it's very precise and very, but, but extremely varied too, depending on the variety. Um, we won't linger here, but I just wanted to give you the overview that uh, anywhere from three, we'll have the trees anywhere from um, three years to at a minimum to maybe seven years for sugar maples and some of the oaks. And then they go on to uh, our customers that take them on to uh, finish landscape size. So year one, this is a uh, Kentucky coffee tree seed, which was soaked overnight in, in sulfuric acid to, to um, 
scarify the seed coat, then they're planted out in fields in, in raised beds. And um, this is just the, the sewing in the center. And then um, there's a, uh, the shot on the right is uh, Cirsus canadensis seedlings, just a really nice stand of, of Cirsus that'll be either grown on as a seedling source tree or or use as understocks for grafting. We, we grow most of our own understocks as well as the, the finished plants. So this is another year one activity. This is the um, an elm um, on the left and uh, they each cutting is cut very precisely to have a, a bud at the bottom and what I call a solar panel on top. The one leaf is trimmed to have one leaf, which acts as the solar panel that brings in the energy to um, make the trees root under these conditions. Those, those cuttings will, with high, high heat and, and lots of water, constant mist, not quite constant, but frequent mist, um, those trees will root pretty quickly. Here are the ladies doing the softwood cuttings again and exclamation plane trees. Leaves on the plane trees are so big that we have to trim them down so that they can fit into the uh, beds. <clears throat> so here I mentioned how quickly they root in that perfect environment. This is a first blush cherry and it was stuck on, we keep very precise uh, records of, of when things were stuck, where the budwood came from. Um, and can track them all the way down. The budwood was cut, it says BF, so that budwood was cut from our stock block, blocks at Barlow Farm, and they were stuck on July 5th, 2017. Softwood, Prunus first blush, and then this, I took this picture maybe three to three weeks, I don't remember the date, but um, it was, they root very quickly under those good conditions. And then here is a picture of the tree in the fall, not that tree, but um, the tree in our landscape in the fall. Just, it's an introduction of ours that is really, really performing well. Another year one, another way to propagate is through grafting. Uh, Wintertime bench grafting, this is our or, a prop, or another propagation farm. And this is where they do uh, hornbeam, ginkgo, uh, cirsus, Japanese maples, lots of different varieties that are, um, that are grafted, started out with grafts. And uh, or they can do, some can do a couple thousand a, a day and we just have really good experienced grafting teams. Another method is tissue culture. Um, this little, I plucked this little red point maple out of one of the agar um, dishes, petri type dishes. Uh, this is a tissue culture lab, uh, one of the several that we contract with every year to, to grow tissue culture plantlets, which then we then transfer into the uh, transplant into the into flats or pots and grow out in in this greenhouse and uh, then they go out to the fields. Uh, this is harvest, harvesting the one year stock. Uh, these were seedlings that were cut or seedlings that are being dug basically with a kind of like a potato harvester type um, machine. And so they're, they're pulled and pulled into the, <clears throat> into the warehouse where they're trimmed and, and then uh, they're stored in the in pallets in our cold storage for spring planting to supply our other nurseries. So the high forest is kind of like the nursery for the nursery. Then uh, those seedlings go out uh, and are planted. And then the later, this was spring planting several years ago. Mount Hood's not quite that close, but I couldn't resist bringing it in with my telephoto lens. It's actually about 35 miles beautiful spot to grow trees. Um, so these are planted, transplanted in preparation for budding, which takes place in the summertime. And yes, they crawl across that vast field on their knees. Um, they, they rest their chests on a padded, um, uh, a pad that rolls along under the sulky, the, the budding cart. 
we call them butter bikes and the butters work in teams of two. Uh, there's the, the butter in front and the, the tire follows behind and ties the, um, ties the new bud, um, secures it to the, the new, new graph. This is a field of um, uh, liriodendron tulip tree seedlings and uh, their budding emerald or cultivar emerald um, emerald city tulip tree to those seedlings that were that were planted the year before um, you can see another budding team over here in the background and uh, they are just amazing craftsmen um, they they work around the country they come back to us every year they do citrus roses and just follow the crops. And there are uh, a lot of them, several of the teams have been working with us for 20 or more years, you know, teach the, some second generation <clears throat> butters and they are just really great folks. And we couldn't do this without them. So um, sharp, <clears throat> sharp tools. And um, you know, this is just a close up of a budding operation. They make that T-shaped cut in the rootstock, then they carve a bud that will match and uh, from branches that we gather <clears throat> and trim. And uh, you know, have to match up the numbers. You have to know how many buds are on, on uh, like a 12 inch stick and calculate it as to match up with, with how many uh, seedlings you have in the field. And I, uh, that's our inventory department's job. And it amazes me every year that they make it come out pretty darn close. So here's the bud from the, the new, new tree from the cultivar, and they just slip it into that T-shaped uh, cut that was made by the, the butter. And then the, this is the tire coming behind with rubber strips securing that bud so it will knit into that seedling. And so they match the cambium layers and tie them and uh, then the trees are on their own and they, they just start start growing. <clears throat> so the growing years, you know, we, we use grow straights. The Schmitz invented the grow straight to this little piece of metal here that um, that keeps the bud, uh, the new newly emerged bud going straight up and doesn't have the dog leg. We decided they decided about 40 or so years ago that dog legs belong on dogs and not on trees. And so they invented this little galvanized piece that really uh, set a new standard for the industry. <clears throat> so those, the bud, the grow straights only stay on for a couple of weeks, then they, they come through and stake. Right now the crews are out staking acres and acres. Um, and then as the trees grow, those are taped to the stakes. And so we have a nice straight trunk. And here's a field, um, a two-year field. Those are Zalcovas that are well on their way to being finished trees. Um, there were these are two-year, what we call a two-year tree. The year before the whips, there had been a row in here in between. Every other row was dug. <clears throat> so they sell whips, and then this was taken on to be a two-year field. So lots of detail. <clears throat> A lot of pruning and training. These are what we call a three-year tree. Now they're not three years old, they're five, seven, but if we only count the, the years that uh, from when they were brought up with that grow straight and uh, the, their time in the field as, as we're finishing the trees. So this is wintertime pruning. Uh, they're on platforms and they bend the top, tree tops over and they're, they're uh, they're tipping the, the top leader, and this is to develop branching and ensure that, and they'll put in a new leader, which is shown here. <clears throat> so establish a new leader to induce branching. And uh, they'll make an angle pruning cut, take off one of the two buds, which they've done up here, put a little piece of masking tape to make that uh, new bud grow straight right up the inside of the tape. So it, it, it's very simple, but it, it's all about the timing. Do it just at the right time to make that tree grow straight. So here's some two-year trees. 
and then this is the, the biggest we grow three with another season they branch more and then these are ready to harvest so harvest um let's see if we can get this video going um, I thought I'd just let you watch here. This is one of many videos that we have on our YouTube channel and kind of encapsulates the, the digging process. Um, you, can, you can watch this on the YouTube channel. I'd like to invite you to subscribe. It's uh, got a lot of information there, and a lot of visuals. It's hard to describe the digging process, but when you see it, um, it all makes sense. This is what we call the front end digger. And this is how we dig a million and a half trees, actually. I'm giving you our, our uh, I guess it was 1.7 million. We, they just, our crews are really, really fast. Um, so this is ivory silk and the diggers, it actually goes maybe two miles an hour. They gather the trees and then they put them in, bring them to the warehouse for grading. He's putting them into different bins. They make sure that the uh, root branching is even. And, and then after they're graded, they are tied into bundles of, of uh, 10, 5, or 3, depending on the size. And then they're stored in the sawdust in the healing beds, in a traditional way, or into our cold storage. So that'll give you a little, little flavor of the effort that goes into it. So this is a picture of one of our older cold storage buildings. We have a real great state-of-the-art one that we built recently, but it does a really great job of keeping the trees dormant. So they're stored and then they're shipped, and depending on when our customer, the best time for our customers to take them. Speaking of cold storage, uh, Tammy Bowman on the right and I, this was day before yesterday, uh, we went out to the new cooler, cooler number seven and door number six, the upstairs, and we pulled a few trees just to encourage some of our customers for the um, <clears throat> for late spring planting. Um, we, we can still do that here and, and uh, in certain climates. It was just a sampler of the big, beautiful bare root trees that, that we can keep. That we can actually keep trees in very healthy storage till June. Uh, we generally turn the coolers off the last week in May, but here's, uh, I, I love bare root. Never get over how, what a miracle it is. Um, this is a sugar time and any magic crab apples that I'm showing. And, and then we had some maples and, um, then we, we took pictures and stuck them back in the cooler. These pipes are solar. This is electrical conduits. All of our, um, our warehouses now have solar panels on top. And this, uh, this is feeding the electricity back into the grid. So we're doing our best to be a little, be a little more uh, um, energy conscious and, and it's really helping uh, reduce our energy costs. So the trees uh, get shipped and they go to our customers. This happens to be a customer in uh, Maryland who uh, got those are espresso Kentucky coffee trees. And I think these are lindens, as I recall, from that visit. And so they, they, either, they line them out either in the field or in, in, uh, in, in containers and grow them on to whatever size works for their production. Uh, here's some uh, red point maples just down at Northwest Shade Trees, which is uh, one of the Schmidt companies. And, uh, and some, uh, those are, don't remember which pink, I think those are real raindrops. And uh, so our customers are the ones who choose the trees that are best for their, their regions and uh, produce them. I, I picked out a few from, this is Loma Vista Nursery, Olathe, Kansas, just across the border. And then of course, Family Tree Nursery is in the Kansas City area. That's Chris Case Beer uh, visiting with, uh, with our good friend and tree guy, Woody uh, at Family Tree with a uh, uh, red point maple that we had actually shipped that one to the nursery. And um, went back in my records and found this picture of uh, Crimson Spire 
oak, yeah, to Markham's nursery in their fields. So Markham's there in, in Oklahoma. So we're uh, got some really great growers in in uh, that part of the, in your part of the country. So this is just uh, you know seed to shade. It's a long process, but uh, growing and you know may take up to 17 years like these ones did. This is Emerald Sunshine, which actually uh, originated in Western Oklahoma with Steve Biebrick. And uh, that happens to be my tree that's just going on to the burlap. I have a little teeny tiny nursery um, that ended up growing very large trees because I planted shortly before the recession hit 2008. So all of a sudden I was in the business of growing big trees. So yeah, we had some big, beautiful emerald sunshines that we shipped off to a project in, in, uh, in uh, Seattle and they're growing up in, in the city. But this was, um, I did the calculation and my, my home and little field is right next to, surrounded by some Schmidt fields. And I thought this was pretty poetic and a great shot because these happen to be emerald sunshine transplants that are across the lane from my house and my little tree patch. And uh, I figured from the time these were propagated and through from cuttings, and then um, from the time I planted them in my, the, so I think they were six foot branched, and then they grew for quite a long time because there was no market at the time. Um, this was 17 years from the time this cutting was stuck till these big trees went off off in the truck to Seattle. So that's just uh, happened to be a serendipitous demonstration of how long it takes to grow big trees uh, landscape for that finished landscape look. So um, it's kind of fun to see the transition. So if you think it takes a long time to grow trees, it takes even longer to develop new trees. And that's something that our company does very well and, and is, is really unique for. Um, this is one of our long-term evaluation blocks. Um, those trees were planted for evaluation 12, 15 years ago. And I can just hear him saying, pick me, pick me. Uh, this was last fall that I took the picture and uh, most of those trees will never go to market. Um, we only uh, you know, there are a combination of trees that other growers sent to us, um, arborists, you know, people who want to say, hey, I think I've got something special. Can you evaluate it for us? So, and uh, many of them are from our breeding program. Uh, they each have a little identifying stake. And of course, the, the computer um, records to back it up. But this is experimental. H4 is the block. This is the block. North 20, Acer rubrum KW140AR. So it might be one of, well, it's the 140th um, red maple Acer rubrum 140AR. And uh, so we might, he might have been the top, one of the top 10 of of several thousand seedlings that looked promising enough to plant out here in the test block for potential um, it, for potential introduction. So very precise record keeping, I can't even imagine. So it's uh, it's really uh, developing new trees is not only it takes a long time, but it's a multi generational effort. And we're fortunate, and the nursery world is fortunate that the Schmidt family uh, believes in the future of trees to keep this going because it's, it's no small project and it takes a lot of resources, a lot of land. So, uh, it, you know, developing a new cultivar pretty much takes a minimum of 15 years. So, speaking of generational, uh, that's Frank Sr. on the right. He was a very prom he was quite a prominent pioneering nurseryman back in the 20s, 10s, 20s, 30s, 40s. And his his son, Frank Jr. on the right, is who started our nursery. And uh, this the little guy in the middle would be Frank III, who is uh, retired last year, ran this company for 40 some years with his sister Jan and his sisters Jan and Jean. 
And um, he just retired last year and he's going to have a significant birthday here in June. Uh, and uh, he's enjoying his retirement, but still looking after the trees and, and uh, frequently here and, and chairman of our board. So um, there's three generations. Of course, we have another generation. Frank now has a grandson and a number of grandchildren, uh, granddaughters, and uh, they're having a lot of fun. So, so our new tree development goals, uh, they can't just be new. They have to be better better than what is on the marketplace, better for a variety of reasons. So they have to have unique traits, either foliage, form, heat resistance, uh, flower. And uh, we were trying to increase the diversity of, of species that can be planted in cities by developing trees that are more heat tolerant or, or uh, could handle the city city growings and climate change adaptable. We're, we're really trying to find trees that are adaptable to uh, abrupt um, seasonal changes, uh, temperature swings, and uh, that, are, that are healthy over a, a wide range of, can be grown over a wide range of growing conditions. And they need to be resilient in tough urban environments. And they need to have natural disease and pest resistance. Um, we don't, we don't want to spray. We don't want to, uh, we want to attract beneficial insects and have pollinator uh, friendly trees and pollinator beneficials. And they need to be easy care and well behaved because none of us have maintenance budgets like in the old days. And they have to be profitably, we have to be able to grow them profitably, because if we don't make profit, uh, we, we won't be in business. And you know, with 350 people, that's pretty good, pretty good payroll. So we want to make sure you can, we can have a really great tree, but if it's hard to propagate um, or just really low um, bud takes and so on, we just have to say, oh, well, we're going to, we either try to we either figure out how to how to grow it successfully or we'd stop growing it. It's also a multi-career effort. Um, we're going into our second generation of plant breeders, or we have gone into our second generation of plant breeders. Keith Warren, he's the KW in the, in the code, the cultivar name of a lot of our trees. He had a 40-year career at J. Frank Schmidt & Son, developed lots of great trees, which I'll mention some of later on. And uh, he retired, I think, six years ago. And, but he has continued to consult and work with Guy Meacham on the transition. And Guy has been at our nurseries for, nursery at, for 37 years and, and counting. He um, arrived here 37 years ago as an intern from England, horticultural intern. And we didn't, leave, we didn't let him leave. So he's been working with Keith. He worked for Keith for most of, well, third, more than 30 of Keith's years at Schmitz. And now he has taken over the project and he's making his own crosses and bringing, uh, bringing a lot of other trees, a lot of Keith, the rest of Keith's trees, uh, the ones that are worthy of introduction. And it's just been a really great smooth transition. So we're really fortunate that for that. So we're we're develop, we're all in about developing cultivars. So what is a cultivar? Well, most of you know, but if if, if somebody doesn't, it's a the word comes from cultivated variety. And that is an asexually propagated plant that has come from a superior parent tree, superior for a very variety of reasons. So the advantages of that predictable performance is a big one and predictable performance in landscape settings is what our goal is. They need to have impressed, improved pests and disease resistance and the landscape architects and designers like the fact that they have genetic uniformity that will ensure design integrity. So I just want to pause uh, we grow a lot of cultivars, maybe we're known for that, but we grow many more seedlings 
Um, I'm in in our efforts to develop cultivars. It isn't to uh, um, say that a seedling is less valuable. They have different places in the marketplace, and both are are extremely important. And um, it's important to make sure that seedlings are used in restoration projects and and uh, you know prop with there'll be discussions about provenance and uh, but our wheelhouse is our company's wheelhouse is trees for urban settings and urban landscapes so that's why cultivars are important to us and uh, over the past 20 years or so native ours have become uh, increasingly important. Um, so what's a native R? Um, it's, I did some digging in the literature and found out that Alan Armitage appears to be the person to have coined that phrase. He's a perennial person, perennial guy, University of Georgia. And he stated, a native R is a cultivar and or hybrid of a native species and should rule the garden. Well, they work pretty well and with trees too. And um, we, we grow, we have developed quite a few cultivars from native trees because uh, Nolan Runquist is city forester for city of Seattle. He says, I'm still looking for the native species that's native to a five by five pit cut into a concrete walk and then filled with construction rubble. So native trees are great, uh, we're all for using them in cities, but uh, a lot of times native trees don't don't do well in urban settings. So what we're our goal for developing these so-called native ours is to develop a tree that will perform well in urban settings. So it's kind of like the athletes of the species. We want trees that are, have good vigor, so this it won't things like this won't happen. Uh, this was a uh, planting of beautiful Carpinus caroliniana, the American hornbeam. Um, their uh, uh, ironwood is a common name, and the, this is in downtown Louisville where they have iron facades on the beautiful historic buildings. And uh, they thought it'd be great to have ironwood in front of the iron buildings but uh, the tree didn't think so much it, it didn't care much for this four by four concrete setting and this is the new city arborist um, giving us a tour at the partners and community forestry conference and she was describing how they're expanding the pits by quite a lot and uh, last time i was there there's some new trees in there that look like they're doing really well i don't think they were some kind of a maple but um you know, the ironwood just didn't work uh, because city streets are not native habitats. Um, in fact, the genetic variability of seedling can work against native trees in urban settings because there's a lot of uh, different growth rates. And, um, and so what we're doing is trying to choose trees that have vigor. That's kind of one of the big factors we're looking for. And then we go to the other. Uh, factors that will make them more successful in cities. Our, our objectives in developing native cultivars is bigger urban adaptability, and tolerance of heat, drought, and poor soils, and insect disease and disease tolerance. So here's just a kind of a sample of natives, native trees. Uh, Redbud's a great example where a lot of new um, cultivars have been developed. Uh, it, it's a variable species, and if they have good genetic variability, that's a good, they're ripe for cultivar development. So here's some you might know, pink heartbreaker, pink pom-poms, redbud, and then forest pansy redbud's been around for quite a long time. And uh, so there's this kind of this cultivar explosion and that the most prominent of the, of the Circus, um developers has been Dr. Denny Warner, Werner from uh, North Carolina State. It didn't happen overnight. He's been working on these for 25 some years, maybe maybe longer. Um, and he's got a couple of great new ones. Uh, Merlot is one of his and uh, he's developed several really good ones. But Golden Falls, 
Uh, this is reported to not burn even in really hot um, climates. So we'll see how it does in Oklahoma. Um, and then flamethrower redbud, just really great. Uh, Joseph's colored, multicolored coat. And then Ruby Falls is just a really nice new uh, weeper. And this tupelo tree -er, trio, like uh, I said about the red buds, didn't happen overnight. Uh, Keith started selecting for um, for upright street tree form. Um, tupelos tend to have a, a lot of them have a floppy top and uh, descending branches, uh, weeping kind of weeping branches. Um, and over the years, they selected trees out of the field, some were upright. And afterburner and fire starter are two just really successful trees that are good forms for city um, for city use. And uh, and then other people have been selecting, started doing the same thing, probably the same time. Uh, this green gable tupelo that we're licensed to grow happens to come from Georgia, selection in Georgia, and it's performing really well. Um, it's an introduction of Bold Spring Nursery in Georgia. Bald cypress has lots of variability, so there have been some good cultivars coming out of that. Uh, Shawnee Brave, I actually took this picture in uh, downtown Tulsa. A great cultivar that's been around for quite a long time. Uh, Lindsay Skyward came down, came from your part of the country, I believe. It was brought to us uh, as a co-introduction. And uh, this is Tammy Bowman. Uh, standing next to the tree in our arboretum. It's really shaping up nicely, a nice columnar uh, taxodium. <clears throat> I see that I think it has a lot of promise for use in bioswales and, um, and uh, narrow spaces. And then Green Whisper was brought to us by a South Carolina customer, but it seems to be very doing very well up in the northern parts of the country too. So it seems to be real adaptable and uh, it's, it's a good, good introduction. <clears throat> Here's a few more. Well, uh, Armstrong Gold is a cultivar of, of red maple and um, uh, Jefferson Elm, um, that's the parent tree on the National Mall. I took that picture a few years ago <clears throat> and it's just a magnificent tree. And I see from our records that we sell quite a few of those into the Oklahoma, Kansas marketplace. Uh, Burr Oak, very successful tree. Uh, we, Keith selected a columnar one. Well, it's not columnar, but it's narrow as Burr Oaks go and it's doing real well. So that we, we have the luxury of, of uh, planting thousands and thousands of seeds every year. And with all that, that beautiful gen genetic diversity, we, if we pay attention and keep our eyes open, we see, um, we see potential trees for introduction. So those get everybody from the, the guy on the end of a hoe um, or the propagators or the people in the fields, people who stake the trees, they're paying attention. Uh, they, everybody would like to find a new, new variety. And so the ones that are unusual get um, flagged and pulled aside and observed for potential introduction. And here, here's a couple more. These actually came from your neck of the woods. Flash fire, of course, is uh, it's our selection of, of uh, sugar, the Western sugar maple from the Caddo Mountain seed source that, that John Pear of Kansas did so much work with. Autumn Splendor and uh, John Pear maple are also from that Caddo seed source. Um, our good customer up in Hiawatha, Kansas, uh, Doug Grimm, it's not just over the border from, from you. Um, he uh, brought us this um, narrow catalpa that he uh, is quite columnar, the, the parent tree. Um, we're not calling it columnar, it's a little broader, but um, it, it's a very narrow as, as catalpas go, and it's doing really well. This is in our, our arboretum. And then Oregon Trail Maple, um, it's, it's, that tree is actually in the city, a city park in Hiawatha, Kansas. So it's a sugar maple that does very well in, in your Midwest climate. So moving on, uh, pathway, these are pathways for creating new cultivars. 
a um, lot of different ways. And I'll just go through these uh, one by one. Uh, one of the first is to discover unusual or standout trees in production rows. And uh, I'll give you three examples of, of introductions we've made just from paying attention to the trees in the field. Uh, that was the way afterburner Tupelo came to be. You always went, hey, that one's got a better red color than, or that one is upright. Let's, let's pull that out of the field and, and watch it. And same with Emerald City tulip tree. Um, I remember probably 15 years ago or so, Keith taking us out to the experimental blocks and saying, okay, these are our top three. Um, he was looking for a compact, a more compact uh, tulip tree um, that would have predictable size and performance, uh, glossy leaves, uh, symmetrical form. And so there were three kind of like finalists. And we all decided, oh, we think that one is the one. So it, it was crowned as being the one and named Emerald City. And um, the inside story on that is that Keith is from Seattle, born and raised in Seattle, which is known as the Emerald City. So, and it's JFS Oz, which is a little, little nod to the Wizard of Oz in the Emerald City. And so, and the Emerald City uh, is even better than its name. It is just a really fine tree <clears throat> that I, I see quite a few going into your region. So it's a, so, um, you know, seedling tulip trees are great, but they can be broad, narrow, columnar, rangy. Um, and so this one is predictable in its form. And uh, at the bottom is American Dream Oak, which is a swamp white oak that we, um, that Keith selected. And uh, it's one of its big features, well, a really nice glossy leaf, but also anthracnose resistant, mildew resistant. So, um, so that's what we're looking for is, is good resistance. Uh, discovers, discoveries in landscapes and gardens, uh, those trees like the, some of the ones that I already described. Uh, somebody spotted those in like a park or, or a garden, uh, like Heartland Catalpa is, is a, a a landscape, a street tree that Doug Grimm noticed up in Kansas. And um, June Snow Dogwood was in a, a landscape in Pennsylvania. It's a, uh, and has been a really good performer, uh, very adaptable. And then City Slicker Birch, that's bark of it down at the bottom. Uh, that's one that uh, Carl Whitcomb um, that caught his eye and he, uh, tested it and introduced it. And we're finding that it's a really good performer for us and all around the country. Um, then we, our maple selection program is a, is a example of planting special seed lots and selecting the best performers. You know, flash fires from the seed from the Caddo Mountains, Armstrong Gold was seed collected in our, our own arboretum. And the Red Point also from our own seed and uh, it was trialed for a long time. <clears throat> you had from this picture on the right, you can see that uh, red sunset maple, which is kind of our flagship tree that was introduced by Frank in uh, 1966. You can see that red point on the right uh, is faster growing, a little more upright. And something we discovered after it was introduced is that it is quite resistant to high alkaline soils. Uh, this was a typical, a red maple, cultivar and these are red point seeds on the on the um, red point leaves on the left and you can see that it it just has a really good dark leaf um, that is um, stays it's quite dark and not not as re, is more resistant to high alkaline soils high pH soils um, Oklahoma and I should say Kansas originals um, powder keg maple, another um, Whitcomb intro from the Caddo seed source. Uh, Emerald Sunshine Elm, probably everybody in Oklahoma knows Emerald Sunshine because of its um, 
uh, origin. It, it came from seed collected in uh, China that was grown out by Steve Biebrick over at Sunshine Nursery. And he brought three or four of his best trees to us for evaluation. And, and this is the one that he and Keith settled on. Um, on the right, uh, and it's extremely adaptable. The trees on the right are a street tree planting in Portland, Oregon, and it, it does well over a wide range of, of, of uh, climates and, and growing conditions. Uh, at the top is um, powder keg, and you can see how uh, glossy and kind of thick those leaves are. And the bottom one is um, uh, autumn splendor maple, which was developed by Dr. John Pear over in, uh, in Wichita, Kansas State. Um, our breed, crabapple breeding program is, is an example of hybridizing top performing cultivars and, and selecting offspring for specific qualities. Uh, the, the purple leaf is an offspring of, uh, that's Royal Raindrops crabapple, which is an offspring of our Golden Raindrops crabapple. The two on the right are pretty exciting, or the two, the other two, the flowers are pretty exciting introductions. Uh, ivory spear and uh, raspberry spear crab apples. Um, they're columnar, truly columnar, and they're just getting out into the marketplace and uh, people are pretty excited about them. And they, again, they didn't happen overnight. They, they happened over a period of some 30, 40 years. Um, uh, here's Guy on the left. Um, he's got uh, some branches that uh, there's some bags, mesh bags over the um, over the branches, over the flowers that are put on before the tree starts flowering <clears throat> to keep the bees out from pollinating. And then, then his assistant, Jim Donahue, there on the right, is he's playing bumblebee, busy bee, um, poll hand pollinating those blooms. They take the bag off, pollinate it with specific um, pollen and then put that bag back on so the tree won't be pollinated with anything else but the, the pollen from the tree, um, the, parent, the, the pollen tree. And that tree, that branch is labeled with what the cross is. So then they'll cut after this fall, they'll cut that branch, harvest the fruit, mass, mash it up and get the seeds out and then plant the seeds the next year. And about three years later, pick a few uh, interesting ones that look, look like they're different and then watch those. So Jim might be pollinating a new cultivar that is, might hit the market in 15 or 20 years. So it's, and it takes meticulous record keeping. The, the yellow, yellow paint marks mean that they're experimental and then everything has its codes and locations and it's it's quite the, quite the record keeping odyssey um, and here are a few trees that have come from that 40-year effort Royal raindrops it is our uh, I ran the numbers for the last four years in in uh, Chris K Spears territory and which is Oklahoma Kansas uh, part of Texas Missouri and so on and anyway the the Top seller is our red point, and then Royal Raindrops is, is second, which is on the left. Sparkling Sprite, we're pretty excited about that tree. I, I call it the perfect tree for, for people who want to prune every tree into a meatball, because this it comes to you as a meatball, leave it alone. It, that tree has never been pruned. It has a perfect rounded form and it, it's really quite a remarkable tree. So you just, just plant it and you've got your topiary. Um, and uh, ivory, it has really beautiful fruit too. Ivory spear and raspberry spear, I, I mentioned those. And uh, those are kind of a breakthrough because they truly are quite columnar. Um, and then interspecific crosses. Um, we've got uh, if you cross two species, you get lots of diversity, lots of interesting combinations. Um, the two on the left, the trees are uh, our Norwegian sunset and Pacific sunset. They've been on the market for a long time. Um, I took that lower picture in Philadelphia street tree. And the other is Norwegian sunsets at our nursery. 
and a new generation, these, these are Acer truncatum, which is a Chinese maple cross with Acer platinoides, which is Norway maple. So the best of the characteristics of both of those are what we're aiming for and uh, you know, heat tolerance and form and so on. And um, the, so the trees on the right are ruby sunset. So we've got a new generation coming on, one of those crimson sunset, which has done really well. So it's pulling those genetics from the Norway maple, the crimson king maple, um, that, that purple gene, but this one does not get the, the crunchy brown, um, crunchy brown leaves of fall. And one thing that we learned through testing is that this is an extremely versatile tree. It, it is actually doing well in North Dakota as well as Georgia. So it has quite a range of uh, abilities to withstand different climates. And, and that's what we're aiming for is the trees that will be uh, broadly adaptable. Here's another one from the cross. You can see how different they are. This little little one is uh, Ruby Sunset. It's quite a bit smaller and more compact and, and uh, the most like Ace of Truncatum of, of any of the hybrids. And then Urban Sunset, you can see I'm showing you all these cultivars because they're, they're extremely different. Um, you know, they're, they share similar characteristics, but, but they all have a different place in the landscape. So to develop those trees, new varieties, to summarize it, to collect, observe, evaluate, and eliminate. Um, well, one of the big factors is what I call practicing tough love. You can see the chainsaw come, come out on, remember that beautiful grove of experimental block trees? Well, it'll, uh, most of those trees will uh, suffer the fate of these trees that were cleared and uh, used for firewood. The, the last tree standing in this picture happens to be urban, the original urban sunset maple. And uh, at the bottom, the evaluation arm of it is um, Frank in the foreground, Guy, this picture was taken several years ago, and Keith with the white hair, and then Mike Durr, uh, who has been really quite instrumental in our plant development. He, he and Keith are very good friends, and, and Mike has made many treks out to Oregon to look at the trees and uh, evaluate them and discuss with Keith. And I, I call them the Siskel and Ebert of trees because they argue vigorously over the merits of various trees. And uh, uh, no, it, it has this or that. No, you need, when are you going to introduce this tree? And well, it's not quite perfect. Oh, get it out there, is what Mike might say sometimes. Anyway, it's just, it's just been a delight to be able to uh, tag along with them and, and learn a lot from trees, learn a lot about trees as, as they discuss their various merits. Uh, another <clears throat> important aspect of tree introduction is testing for regional suitability and adaptability. So this is just a snapshot of where we send our trees every year to be trialed. We send some new trees out and you can see we tried to cover a lot of different, um, a lot of different climates. And um, uh, down here in Oklahoma, um, Tulsa Botanic Garden and we've got uh, in Kansas, uh, John Pear Center at Wichita. Um, up here, North Dakota, North Dakota State in Fargo, where most trees go up there to die. Uh, but every once in a while, something is hardier than we thought it would be, right? like the Crimson Sunset that I, that I mentioned. Um, it has done well up here in North Dakota, as well as down in Georgia. So where we, we are surprised by trees all the time. They're, they're more resilient. Um, you don't know how they're going to perform until you get them out there and try them in different climates. <clears throat> and this, this trial pack, um, it's a combination of, of universities, uh, growers, uh, customer growers of ours, and uh, arboretums. And uh, we just, the, we really depend on this information to help us uh, determine whether a tree is worthy or not. <clears throat> 
So just, you know, sometimes you just kind of have to do some daydreaming. And, and um, this is one example that Guy shared with me. Um, I don't know that this tree would be appropriate for your region, but I just am sharing it. <clears throat> it's probably 30 years out in the future, but wouldn't it be great to have a weeping red fox katsura? So um, to make that happen, maybe this is the parent tree, one of the early trees uh, up, upper left is a, is a, um, a uh, amazing grace katsura, which is a tree in Louisville that was developed by Theodore Klein and wonderful tree. So we have one here in the Arboretum. This is a little snapshot of our Arboretum. Here's amazing grace and we planted red fox right here and the two kind of meet in the middle. You never know what's going on in the arboretum at night. <clears throat> but uh, anyway, so we planted, uh, you know, time did some matchmaking, planted those two close together and collected seed. And we also got seed from the same combination from the arboretum. So this is seed from our arboretum. This is seed from the National Arboretum. Uh, the, both are open pollinated, but they're both trees in the vicinity of red fox and, and weeping katsura. So they planted seed and every one of them came up and just a little bit of the seed, but they all came up and they all looked exactly alike. There were 5,000 transplants and none of them seemed to be standouts at all. But, but the magic of plant breeding is in that next generation um when they will recombine and and you'll get some really interesting um interesting characteristics from both from both both of the trees so he, guy explained to me that tree breeding is really a numbers game you know whether they're specifically crossed or open pollinated the timeline might look like this so in like in the example of that i shared 5,000 seedlings uh, one year, watch those for two to three years, you might keep 500, years four to five, keep 50 to 100, year five, the best ones um, might keep 10 to 15, and those will go out into the trial block, the, the beautiful forest that I showed you earlier. <clears throat> Give them a code number, and then year six, um, start watching them more closely just from the six out of the 5,000 that you started with. And then um, after 10 to 15 years, consider introducing one of those trees, maybe, and uh, introduce that. So, and you may not get anything. You know, it's happened plenty of times like this. Um, and then you might have something that's not quite right, like this double pink, columnar crab apple, it's just, it's just swoon worthy, but the um, disease resistance is not up to our standard. It, it has to have clean foliage. It has to, all the, all the numbers have to match. Everything has to be great before we'll introduce anything. So back they go out into the trial block and, and for evaluation. And the, the lower right picture is one of our field trials where the trees, you can see the darker leaf ones, they're out in a regular production row. And we have to make sure that those trees can be propagated and, and grown like we grow the other ones and fit into our field situation. <clears throat> so here's, I'm gonna give you just a couple of timelines of introductions we've made. Street Spire Oak is the same cross as uh, Crimson Spire Oak. Um, the difference being that it loses its leaves cleanly in the fall, <clears throat> one of the differences. So back in 91, uh, Keith pulled out seven upright narrow growing hybrids from, and they were crosses of Rober and Alba, and they looked promising. So they got planted out for observation. Okay, so in 96, hybrid oak number seven produced some acorns, which is, was very exciting. So those got uh, harvested and planted in a seed bed for more observation. So in 99, 12 of those seedlings were selected for further evaluation. <clears throat> 12 of those uh, 
seedlings off of uh, hybrid oak number seven. So 2003 rolls around and uh, one of those standout seedlings was named JFS KW2QX, code being J. Frank Schmidt, Keith Warren, number two Quercus Cross. And so there were, if there were 10, there would have, they would have continued to be trialing KW10, KW5. So this happened to be KW2. Uh, superior appearance, form, vigor, and resistance to powdery mildew. Have good fall color, so on. So from 2003 to 2010, it was test propagated to make sure it was stable, it's, that its traits were, were uh, passed on and that it was unique and it had to perform well in the nursery. And as that was going on, they were increasing stock for future introduction. So you have to propagate some trees to get budwood off of too before you can move forward on an introduction. So 2003, um, let's see, so 2012 rolls around and we introduced Street Spire Oak in our catalog and uh, the patent was granted in 2014. So this, this tree was 23 years in the making and uh, it, it's getting better every year. So um, Keith was right, um, it, it is a really good performer and a good seller for us. But there were many trees that got, uh, got culled along the way before this one came along. So another little timeline, this is that little tissue culture maple that I showed you in the greenhouse. And here's what it looked like, looks like in a park or in a uh, in University of, of Chicago uh, plaza. Um, so it was 17 years of research and development and then another 13 years to take our, from our propagation and growing on by Caneville Nursery in Illinois. So since the, and it was from the first, these trees were from one of our first crops. And uh, so the seeds were sown in 89. We introduced a tree in 2006, shipped some to Caneville Nursery in Illinois. And they, those trees were grown to four to five inch caliper and planted at this, this Criar Science Quadrangle, Quadrangle at University of Chicago. And it's just a beautiful landscape. So those trees were, uh, they were an idea in 1989 and now they're just a beautiful grove of trees in downtown Chicago. And this is uh, the Red Point, <clears throat> which is, is a really good, good tree for us and for the, for the around the country. Um, Kentucky coffee tree, even longer timeline. And this, I'm sharing this because it's a great story and it's a great tree for your region. Um, back in 1964, some pioneering California arborists and tree scientists um, thought, hey, we need to diversify our city forest in Davis, Davis, California. And so they, they got a hold of 20 seedlings of, of Kentucky coffee tree. And so let's try Kentucky Kentucky coffee tree here in Davis, California, which is not too far from, from uh, uh, Sacramento. And it's the university there. So there were some innovative people there. Um, so they planted all those trees on a street in Regis Street in uh, Davis, residential street. They planted all of them down either side of the street. And one of those trees landed in Mrs. Brashear, the Brashear yard. And uh, Mrs. Brashear, who is in her well into her 80s, is holding a picture of the tree that they took when uh, a few years after it was planted. And she's actually leaning on that tree. So, I mean, it's rare to have people stay in the same house for all these years. But this uh, Mr. Brashear passed away, but Mrs. Brashear still lives there. And she loves that tree. Um, and the way we came, how we came to have it as an introduction is that um, uh, a, a forest service urban forester was keeping an eye on those trees. And he picked out one that was a male that seemed extra nice. 
and good form on the left. And so and he showed it to Keith. And so Keith says, sure, send us some cuttings. So we started propagating it. In 1986, we received some cuttings and started growing it. And then I wondered if the tree was still there. So I, I suggested our sales rep go, well, I looked on Google, did a little, little uh, Google tree sleuthing. And here was this, there it was right in front of that house. And it had grown in 2000, from 2000, uh, from 86 to 2001. Uh, here it was at 47 years of, of age, uh, just in front of the same house, it looked exactly the same. And, um, then in 2018, Dr. Greg McPherson, recently retired from the Forest Service, um, he nominated it for, uh, he and some of the Davis people uh, nominated it as a Davis heritage tree. And he took this picture of it, which is 54 years from the time it was planted there on that street in Davis and it, it's thriving today. So, um, so we introduced that tree in 1994, and it took a long time. It was a tough character. It was hard to propagate, but we finally had hard to get it to branch. We finally figured it out. And I just wanted to show you just from, I ran this graph a while, graph a while back. Um, 2010, we had about 9,000, and 2000, um, it was up into 30,000 a year. So it just kind of this graph kind of shows the popularity of how long it takes from this tree that was started, discovered back in the 60s, planted in the 60s, and, and now in 2020, 21, it is uh, a great seller. The irony being that hardly anyone in California plants it, but uh, we don't sell very many in California, but it's a a great seller in, in the rest of the country, a lot of the rest of the country. Um, and then one more is uh, the exclamation plane tree. Uh, that tree was uh, selected, it was part of Dr. George Ware's work at the Morton Arboretum. He started working on the tree in the early 80s. And uh, uh, the story or the timeline for that is kind of described in detail on this page from our reference guide. And I'll also share um, the, this handout um, with, with Mike and uh, we'll either, you can either ask for it directly or, or, or the webinar will arrange for you to be able to download it. I've got some resources on the back page um, that just, uh, tell some things about this, the trees. Uh, so who discovers new trees? I'm getting a little, getting close to wrapping it up here. Um, well, they come to us from a lot of different ways. Uh, that was Dr. Phil Barker that brought this espresso to our attention. And Denny Townsend, some of you may remember his, his work with elms and maples. He, uh, Frontier Elm is a great seller in your your region, you can thank your, your tax dollars at work on that. That was a USDA, uh, he was plant geneticist and he developed a lot of good elms, including Frontier and Homestead and the Sun Valley Maple, Red Rocket Maple. Uh, so that was his life's work was developing new trees. Um, there was actually three plant breeders that were real instrumental in, in bringing us disease resistant elms that uh, to replace the, the void left by Dutch elm disease for our American elms. Danny Townsend, that, the frontier elm that's in our, our parking lot. Uh, Dr. George Ware did all that great work at Morton Arboretum. <clears throat> and then uh, Dr. Jean Smalley up in, in uh, Wisconsin did a lot of good work, including uh, developing uh, New Horizon elm. They were confused about elm parentage. Uh, Keith figured it out. Uh, this is just a really handy chart. And just knowing the heritage of the trees really is helpful in understanding their characteristics and how they will perform in the landscapes. And you can find that with a lot of other information on our website. Uh, trees might be discovered in the great outdoors. Uh, the slender silhouette was discovered in Tennessee. Um, it's looking great next to the Willamette River at the boat landing. I noticed that when we were putting, a, putting our boat in, just like, oh, look at those slender silhouettes. 
prairie sentinel hackberry was discovered in western Kansas. And it's a co-introduction. Kansas State brought that to us. So the half the royalties benefit Kansas State. And prairie gold aspen is, is a real good performer for the Midwest. And it was discovered on the Kansas prairie. Uh, North Dakota State does a lot of great work. Uh, spring welcome magnolia, great for late, it's hardy up in North Dakota, but it also blooms a little later. So if in areas where frost, late frost is an issue for magnolias, this is a good one. Uh, it's a star type magnolia. Northern Herald Redbud, um, it's, it's from North or South Dakota, but it's doing well around the country. And Northern Acclaim Honey Locust is an upright honey locust, uh, one, one that's real hardy for North Dakota. So they, they've introduced many good trees. A lot of them do well in your, your dry, your prairie type uh, climate too. So yeah, look to them for good intros. Dr. Tom Ranny brought us Chastity Pear, which is a sterile pear. Uh, really looking like very promising as a replacement for the calorie pears that are the more the invasive ones. This one is uh, very, very, very low. It's not, it's not a calorie pear. It's a complex hybrid and it's looking really good for the teacher. Mercury magnolia and then pink cascade cherry. Uh, also good performers. Uh, Dr. Mike Durr. Everybody knows Mike. Uh, he, I caught him in saying hallelujah when he walked into our uh, greenhouse and saw all of his, his babies in there. Presidential Gold Finko and Golden Colonnade are from Mike. And then Beacon Oak is a, is a uh, columnar swamp white oak that he brought to us. And it, it's doing shaping up very nicely, very well. Uh, Earl Culley, what a great guy. I noticed that a lot of uh, heritage oaks go into your region, which is a hybrid that he named or he selected. And of course, Shawnee Brave, everybody knows uh, Earl for Shawnee Brave and heritage um, maple. Um, it was a, really a pleasure to see him just a few years before he passed away. He, he, he kept going to the nursery uh, I landscape show, and he uh, always had a passion for trees. Steve Beaverick, of course, Sunshine Nursery. Uh, here are the trees in Portland, and also uh, White Shield Osage Orange. He brought those in the, into commerce. Um, and I just, I was happy to see that um, Steve will be a guest presenter at the August 18th lecture and a topic being Providence Matters. So I've kind of been talking about Providence specific trees. And so I'll, I'll tune into that one and uh, look forward to learning some things from Steve. He's a great plantsman. Frank Schmidt Jr. Uh, we, we owe a lot to him. He had the vision to not only select red sunset maple, but to invest in new trees for the future with, with the considerable investment in, in all of our plant uh, plant development. And Keith Warren, plantsman author, JFS Emeritus, he, he, he shows up now and then. We're, we're happy to, he continues to help evaluate trees and, and when he's not hiking or fishing, he, he'll stop by the nursery sometimes, so it's wonderful. And he, uh, he got busy writing a book, which I'll mention later. So Armstrong Gold, Urban Pinnacle, Raspberry Spear, all part of his, his genius. Emerald City Tulip Tree, there's Keith with one of the leaves. Red Point Maple, Royal Raindrops, those are all KWs. And so uh, how about you? So keep your eyes open. Um, there might, you might have find the next great tree. And uh, speaking of Keith and Mike, um, I have to recommend this tree, this book. Keith retired uh, probably six years ago, uh, partly so he could write this book. And he and Mike teamed up. Uh, it is just fabulous. Um, if you can see me here, but it's on my desktop. 7.3 pounds, 900 pages, and tons of wisdom. Um, 
and it is a definitive guide for superior trees for streetscapes, landscapes, and gardens. You must have it. It's just an indispensable. It's not like Mike's tree guy or his uh, manual woody plants. It's different. Lots of pictures, a couple thousand pictures, and uh, it rates the value, the, the uh, street value, whether it's a good street tree or not, what its landscape use is. Very useful. Um, the Kindle version is uh, also very useful <clears throat> and uh, doesn't weigh as much and it's portable. So that said, I would just like to say thank you for listening, for your attention, and to please come visit us uh, next time you're in Oregon or make a special trip. We'll make it worth your time. So thank you very much. Thank you, Nancy. That's excellent. Thank We've you. got some, uh, Nancy, we have some questions in the in the chat box. Mm -hmm. And you've already kind of alluded to Bradford pears, but one of our attendees just asked if, if you've ever grown Bradford pears. Um, um, not in, no, Schmitz did not ever, they may have grown them when they were first introduced, but um, sure. they always grew Chanticleer, Aristocrat, but never Bradford. Okay. They have well, grown some, quite a few cultivars of, of uh, calorie pear. So we're paring that down along with the market demand. And then Chastity is, um, it's one quarter Cleveland. It's a complex hybrid and it's got some other species. Um, and it is, uh, I don't know, 98.7% sterile. And um, so we're working on getting that on a non-calorie. I mean, we're selling it now. Um, it's on a calorie route. Uh, but uh, we're working on getting it on the probably the Farmingdale um, root stock and also working trying to get it on own root. Um, and it's, uh, you know, we don't want to throw the baby out with the bath water on, on uh, any of the trees, like, like, uh, um, well, Bradford, I think, is brittle, but there are a couple, several good cultivars, and we'll continue to sell those to areas where it's not invasive. Like, it isn't invasive here. We have such dry summers that they don't seed, and they're, they're quite used quite a bit in California, Colorado, and, um, and so that's, that's where our market is. The market is finding itself. Gotcha. Thank it's you. Finding itself, I guess you'd say. Okay. Well, uh, Nancy, one of our landscape architects, Connie Scothorn, asked, do you use cover crops below your trees? Um, we do in the aisles. Um, we cover crop, um, we generally use what's called poco barley, and it's a short barley that um, prevents erosion, gives um, gives traction to the diggers. Um, the the band, there's a spray band right on the trees uh, or in, in the trees where you see they're, they're clean, clean rows, but um, we minimize chemicals. Thank you. And I think you already saw that Donna's doll is my colleague's way ahead of me. She's already got the uh, your handout uh, posted where people can get that. Um, that, that you offered today. So thank you for, for right. setting that up for yeah. us, both you and Donna. Yeah, and, it'll be available um, next week, Mike. Yeah, I, I failed to say that. We didn't yeah. quite finish it. So, cause I like yeah. to custom, I wanted to customize it for your, for this audience, so. No, thank you for that added effort. Yeah. We appreciate that. So, okay, you just got stroked, Nancy. I hate to, I hate to increase your uh, caliper of your head, but uh -oh. one of my early, one of my early mentors, Dr. Garrett Coopers, just sent me a direct message says, Mike, this was very fun and educational. Great job. Well, great job to you, Nancy. I didn't do anything but uh, <laughs> stir, stir the coffee, but this was didn't fantastic. Didn't but track me down and keep asking me until I had to say, oh, yes. Okay. <laughs> yeah. So thank you for that. Yeah. Oh, no. we, we, we've got to we've got to get you back here physically within the next 12, 24 months. This is so much fun. It's just kind of like a teaser. 
Just the, buy me the... a ticket. I'll be I'll be there. Give me a plane Absolutely. ticket. I'll, I'll follow you anywhere. <laughs> Got you. Well, thank you. Um, Nancy, I really liked your comments on natives and as good as they are, they're not always the answer sometimes. And I really appreciate your insights on that. Yeah, it was, I, you know, in retrospect, it was really visionary on Keith's part, like 30 years ago, to see it coming that people were, that natives were going to be in demand. And it, it, it's take, he started selecting you know, about the time, well, before I came on, I've been, I'll, I'll be 28 years here in um, July, and Keith was selecting natives, cultivars of native trees, and uh, you know, that took, to me, in retrospect, that took a whole lot of foresight and um, a lot of effort, and well, like one of the other ones is um, uh, Autumn Treasure uh, Hop Hornbeam. Uh, which one of the things it has a nice form and it also drops its leaves cleanly and um, so he's, there's a lot of and guy is working on some more carpinas and um, yellow wood and other secret stuff and uh, so it, it's a it's a long-term effort yeah american yellowwood is such a fantastic species i can't wait to see what you do with it so uh -huh. I can't either. It's all, it's all a real secret. <laughs> yeah, you'd, you'd have to kill me if you yeah, told me more to get <laughs> yeah. it. But yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, looking, for, looking for other thoughts and questions from the audience. I don't want to monopolize this. Uh, and Nancy, we did have Keith down here about a decade ago. So he's also, maybe we could get him back as well someday. Well, you might have to go up above the timberline and on a remote mountain lake where well i i fish so maybe i could maybe i could lure him no pun intended with some uh with Very some good. Yeah. he's enjoying his retirement well he's more he's more than earned it for four decades yeah. yeah you just got another another sweet nothing thank you for the session it was fantastic enjoyable and very interesting i appreciate it a lot well, couldn't thank agree you. more nancy you bet yeah. thank you Thanks for making us look so good. And I'm excited so, that you're thinking so about that joining. Comment, wait, I have to tell you that comment from PH, is that Pavel Hofrek? We have an international guest. Hello, Pavel. He was an intern. He's from Czech Republic. Okay. Hi, Nancy. Hello, everyone. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> it's great to hear from you. <laughs> Aren't you up past your bedtime, young man? <laughs> <laughs> that's oh that's great thank you <laughs> but i was saying that yeah i was saying nancy we'd love to have you join in with the b bricks we're going to do all three generations uh so currently the three generations that are in charge there in clinton oklahoma so it's going to be great fun oh that sounds wonderful yeah 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 this talk um i it so much of it is what we take for granted um, the time, um, I mean, it's what we do, and, but so many people don't know, um, how complex it is. So that's, I've been, uh, you know, trying to share that around. It really gives people a greater appreciation of how much effort it takes to grow good trees. Yeah. You just, you just read my mind, Nancy. So when I'm out working with consumers and a very, very small percentage, but nevertheless, some of them, if they're not you know, hardcore plants people will say, that's a really, really expensive specimen or expensive tree. And you, you just reminded me tools or things to remind them that these just don't sprout up overnight. Yeah, yeah. I, I mean, obviously you don't just throw a seed in the ground and a nice tree comes up. Uh-uh. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, you and get a lot of- say how expensive a tree is, I want to say, how much did those curtains cost when you finished your house? <laughs> yeah, right. Or how much is that sheet of plywood? <laughs> Absolutely. And then and then start comparing enjoyment and for how long you get out of them and yeah. you go on and on and all the other side benefits. Good points. Yeah. yeah. The um the value of trees that the work that the Forest Service has done over the last 30 years has just been invaluable that 
you know, they, they picked all those leaves and they measured all that rainwater that, that, that the trees held and um, just all the, the number crunching and the, um, the work done by our Forest Service uh, scientists has just been remarkable. Yeah. Nancy, I have a question for you. So when you and I were talking, I think this was last year when I was uh, trying to lure you to, to, to today's presentation, which I'm so excited has come to fruition. I know you've got your plot of land that you that you alluded to that you're playing on. And if I recall, one of your objectives with you and your grandsons and whoever else is working with you, you're, you're trying to do some of the more obscure and rare plants. Did I listen correctly that down uh, the phone? Yeah, or? things that are not... Um that don't fit into nursery production, like a, you know, a real nursery that's trying to make a profit and has a payroll. Um, uh -huh. You know, I have to have a day job to support our little nursery. <laughs> sure. But uh, yeah, things. Um, but I mean, what's your dream then with some of these? I mean, you're going to obviously convince a certain population that it's worth the effort for the, these obscure species to be commercially introduced i mean that's is that where you're um, ultimately going this well on on our level it's just really small like like some of the like right now we're just kind of doing uh the gary oak the native gary oaks and uh -huh. uh, some of the evergreen oaks which which people in portland really want the evergreen oaks um but they're just not a production plant you know not on our kind of level that they're uh, too slow. A lot of things are too See. slow. Uh -huh. um, or, you know, they just don't, they don't transplant well. And um, What about the Mexican oaks when you mention evergreen oaks? I'm just curious. Yeah, those, the Mexican oaks, like those have uh -huh. done pretty well for us at our little, little okay. tree for you nursery. But just in having grown them, um, I, I don't think they'd ever fit into a you know, a volume production nursery like ours, they, they just take forever. <laughs> I see. Yeah, I see. Okay. Yeah, yeah just, um, you know, monkey puzzle trees and uh, just kind of some oddities. The harder than uh, Psychoparodia and uh, the harder they are to pronounce, the, the more fun it is to grow them, I think. Maybe there's... <laughs> That's, I like that. So. And actually, um, the... The, our little nursery is uh, my son Neil runs it and it's very part-time it's very small and I, I think the biggest value for me is that it's made me better at this job because I know how hard it is how, uh -huh. how hard it is to grow good trees <laughs> we've lost a lot of trees so yeah. I see really really interesting you have such a such a neat well-rounded life and I I, I envy you all the <laughs> No, I really do. I've, I've followed your career for decades and I, I know how much fun you've got to be having. So. Well, it's it's fun to work here that the, the Schmitz gave, well, there wasn't a marketing position at the time and, and, and Jeff, who you met, who helped me get online here and, um, you know, he and I developed the, the marketing and the branding and so on. And, and it's been just a great evolution and, and the Schmitz have been great to work for and continue to yeah. be great to work for so it's it's a good good fit yeah no yeah. sure it is well we're grateful for your time today it looks like uh i don't see any other comments and uh we're, we're grateful for your effort and putting in this award-winning powerpoint this is a real treat today right and again hopefully it'll be you know something where you can parlay it into a and to a talk in the flesh, so to speak, uh, <laughs> for here, here in uh, here in Oklahoma. Yeah. So we sent some that, trees to some trial trees. We've been sending some trial trees to the Tulsa uh, Botanic Garden, so it'll be fun to see those coming along. And sure. Uh, yeah, I got to make a pitch for careers in horticulture. Um, I was an accidental hiring here and turned into a tree tree geek. Um, but you know, I was hired for my writing skills, and then I learned a lot of trees, tree information by the seat of my pants, but and just by listening and learning. But um, this, we're in the middle of a. We collectively, as a as a nursery industry, are in the middle of a 
very large uh, generational change. Um, all of this, I'm I'm one of the oldsters now, and um, there's a lot of careers. You know, tell your students that they're to stick with horticulture because I think that the pay will be much better because there'll be fewer people that are uh, skilled and. Um, you know, trees are becoming more and more recognized as being valuable, and there's some good careers out there in um, in horticulture and tree growing, and, and we're hiring. So <laughs> there you go. That's <laughs> exciting. Just a great business to be in. So yeah, I I want to brag on you, but I haven't had a chance to get on my smartphone. So I heard you at the beginning before we started this live. You were just featured in Horticulture Magazine. Is that right? Is <laughs> yeah. And women in horticulture, don't be modest. Tell us about where we can read about you, please. I'm serious. Um, well, it, uh, yeah, uh, Scott Berlin's writing a mon monthly feature on, on women in horticulture. And so it was a Q&A. And so he asked a lot of questions. And I, I'm never at a loss for words when, when it comes to writing. And so... Um, it turned out to be a pretty, pretty big story and just kind of uh, more about my, my work and doing what I just did today is, is teaching people about how we grow trees and how we develop them okay. and uh, how important they are. And um, yeah, it's just turned out to be a nice story. That's neat. I'm sure the evolution of your career over the years and yeah, that's neat. Uh, so that's I, in horticulture, correct? I tell people I'm uh, accident. I was just hired for the summer to help Keith Warren um, uh, do some, write some tree descriptions, and I, I made myself useful and stuck around. So, you wow. know, don't Good don't look, you. people shouldn't look down their noses at temporary jobs because it can develop into something nice. I, I I've been really fortunate to have some great mentors, you know, Keith and. Um, Mike and Mike Durr and uh, yeah, it's it's been and, and of course the Schmidt family have been really supportive too. So you bet, that's fantastic. Well, I'm happy for your ongoing success. I really am, and thank you for your time today, Nancy. I hope you have a hope you have a great summer. If we don't talk in the next few months, and uh, but again, hopefully we'll talk over Zoom. I guess coming up yeah. with the, with the uh, yeah. Bricks. So. Hard, yeah, hard to believe that uh, it's been 30, well, 25 years maybe since, since we uh, first met. And uh, I remember Jim Ord telling me that, hey, there's this up and coming young professor at Oklahoma State. And so he was right. <laughs> and, God, you don't really, our company owes a great debt of gratitude to horticulture professors like you and, um, you know, Oh, hard to name, but you know Jeff Isles up in Iowa, and just this network of of um, university professors, horticulture people, has just really been invaluable to the success of this company. And you know Keith, Keith started reaching out to them way back forty years ago, and um, yeah, Ed Hassel has all these legendary people. Uh, who became legendary, but um, it's just that that collaboration with academia and, and arboretums is just, I think, been key to Schmidt's success is to connect with um, academia. It works both ways. Yeah. So thank you. Learn some mystery, guys. Thank you, guys. Thank you so much. And uh, again, appreciate your time. Hope you have a a great summer and we'll, we'll talk soon nancy thank you all for tuning in today and stay in touch and hope everybody has a good remainder of their day all right, all right. thank you thanks nancy sure. thank you thank so you much bye-bye bye, -bye. bye, -bye.